Um, everyone communicates as you connect. What we're talking about today is connecting with your audience in a way that makes your communication more lasting and more effective. In 1966, a communicator was born. Don't do the math. Um, I just turned 50. Um, my first gift, instead of being a pacifier, was a PowerPoint clicker. My friends were playing with baseball mitts and Etch-a-Sketches. I had Prezi. But communicators, as we know, are not born. They're made through years of practice. In my case, 27 years of practice, teaching, uh, vocational training, English as a second language, food safety training, guard card training. And I'm still practicing to this day. Now, thank you for coming to this adaptation of John Maxwell's Everyone Communicates, Q Connect. Here's some Hollywood folklore that touches on this idea of connecting with your audience and with your listeners. Um, George Stevens, the director, was um, filming The Greatest Story Ever Told, and he was directing John Wayne, the legendary actor, when delivering the line, truly, this was the Son of God. So he comes to Wayne and he says, John, don't you realize in this scene, you are talking about Jesus. You have to say the line with awe. So on the next take, John Wayne summons all of his passion, all of his energy, all of his focus and emotion and says, awe. Truly, this was the Son of God. So, connecting principles, the number one principle, connecting is the ability to identify with people and relate to them in such a way that influence uh, increases our influence with them. Ralph G. Nichols, former president of the International Listening Association, said that it's the number one criteria for advancement and promotion for professionals is an ability to communicate effectively. And communication, as we all know, is the number one criteria for communicating effectively with our families, with our siblings, with parents, with our extended family, in business, in the marketplace, and at work. Presidential historian Robert Dalek says that uh, successful presidents possessed five skills, five qualities. Let's look at each one of them. The first one is vision. They have to have a vision that unites the people. One that is pragmatic, that makes sense. Consensus building of all the constituents. Charisma, that's also important if you're a presidential candidate or if you are the president. And trustworthiness. So these skills are directly related to communicating and connecting with others. Connecting is the ability to identify with people and relate to them in such a way that it increases our influence with them. And sometimes our, our connections uh, get crossed. I was doing a lot of traveling this past quarter for business, and um, for early morning flights, I rely on my wife to wake me up. Um, and we had been arguing for the past couple of days. If you're in a long-term relationship, you know what I'm talking about. And it was just silence, Cold War, and I had a problem because I had to tell her to wake me up the next day for this flight to New York. So, being the thought leader, the thinker that I am, I found a post-it, purple one I remember, and I wrote on it, please wake me up at 4.30 a.m. I have an important flight to catch. <laughs> well, she's usually my alarm. So I put on her pillow, and I went to sleep. 
The next day, I looked at my clock. It said 8 o'clock a.m. So I was furious. I missed the flight. I missed the whole thing. I had to reschedule. But then I looked again at the nightstand. She had turned over the post-it, and she wrote, it's 4.30 a.m. Get up. <laughs> so she communicated with me the same way I communicated with her. And uh, we got our wires crossed. And after that, I did get a better phone alarm. So sometimes we get our wires crossed, and there are connecting signals that are important to know. Um, extra effort, going the extra mile to make yourself clear. Unsolicited appreciation. People say positive things about you and positive things about the work that you're doing. Unguarded openness. People demonstrate trust with you. Increased communication. People express themselves more readily with you. Enjoyable experiences. People feel good about what they're doing. Emotional bondedness. People display an emotional connection. Positive energy. People's emotional batteries, so to speak, are charged. Growing synergy. People's effectiveness is greater than the sum of their contributions. When they work together, they could do more work in a better fashion. And unconditional love. They're accepting without reservation. And I don't know if any of you have ever taken um, a second language. I speak uh, English, French, Spanish, and Hebrew. It's a long story. Um, and it has helped me throughout my life. But sometimes things get lost in translation. Um, you have this anecdote in your handout. It's called Jorge Rodriguez, the bank robber. Jorge Rodriguez was a famous Old West bank robber in the early 1900s. And he operated along the Texas border. So the Texas, put together, the Texas Rangers put together a special task force to capture Rodriguez in action. One day, one of the uh, special uh, rangers saw Rodriguez going back into Mexico uh, from the border uh, to his hometown and followed him at a discreet distance, just to make sure that um, he didn't feel the tail that someone was onto him. And then he saw him mingling with people in the town square, and then finally, he went into his favorite cantina to relax and have a few uh, cervezas. Maybe they had some Coronas or some Victorias at that time. And the ranger goes into the bar, puts a gun to Rodriguez's head and says, Jorge Rodriguez, I know who you are. Unless you return all of the money that you have stolen from the banks in Texas, I'm going to blow your brains out all over this bar right now. So Rodriguez is freaking out, right? He knows the ranger is serious, but he can't communicate with him. So he starts rambling off in Spanish. Yo tengo dinero, te voy a regresar todo. I'm going to give everything back to you, right? But the ranger doesn't understand. So this boy comes up and says, I speak English and Spanish. I could help you translate. So the ranger says, okay. So Rodriguez says, listen, tell the big Texas ranger they have not sent, uh, spent a cent of the money. If he goes to the town well, faces north, and counts down five stones, there's going to be a loose one in the back. Lift it up. All the money is under there. Tell him, tell him quickly. So the boy looks at the ranger and says, Senor? Jorge Rodriguez is a very brave man. He says he is ready to die. So connecting is number one um, strategy.
strategy, uh, Jay Hall, PhD of telemetrics. He said there's a direct correlation between achievement and the ability to care for and connect with people. So high achievers, average achievers, and then there are low achievers. So basically the high achievers cared about people as well as profits. However, the average achievers concentrated on production. Low achievers were preoccupied with their own security. High achievers view subordinates optimistically. Average achievers focus more on their own status and security. And low achievers showed a basic distrust of subordinates. High achievers always sought advice from those under them. Average achievers were more reluctant to seek advice from those under them. Great to show a lack of power. And low achievers typically do not seek advice. High achievers actively listen. Average achievers listen to only superiors. And low achievers avoid communication and usually rely on policy manuals. Also author Jim Collins of the novel Good to Great says that great companies don't rely on markets or on products, or on even technology. They rely on retaining high caliber people. So as you can see from this study, the ability to connect with people depends on how much value you're giving them through your communication. Session two, connecting principle that connecting and communicating is all about others. If you are a leader or if you are a supervisor, you cannot communicate from your position. Just because you have a title, just because you have status, just because you have followers, don't communicate or connect through status alone. Everybody knows who the king of the jungle is. Who's the king of the jungle? What's that? The lion, right? The lion is the king of the jungle. One day the lion was prancing around. He wanted to make sure that everybody knew that he was the king of the jungle. So he approaches the monkey and says, Monkey, who is the king of the jungle? So the monkey looks up sheepishly and says, Well, you are, sir. That's right. Don't you forget it. And then he approaches the snake and says, Snake, what are you doing just lying around? Tell me, who is the king of the jungle? So the snake looks up and says, Well, you are, sir. And then the, um, the lion continues walking through the jungle and he sees the elephant and says, Elephant, who is the king of the jungle? The elephant just ignores him and keeps on walking. He can't be bothered with the lion. Not today. So the lion doesn't like this. The lion doesn't like being ignored. So he thrashes at the elephant, draws some blood. Now the elephant is angry. Wraps the lion in his trunk, throws him against the ground four or five times, then lifts him up, throws him against the tree, and then keeps on walking. And the lion says, well, you didn't have to get so angry just because you didn't know the answer. Right? So don't always lead from position. Connecting with people is about them, not ourselves. It's a learned skill based on attitude about people and your general opinion 
of them and the relationship that you have with them. Um, on this note, I think of when I was a, a teacher starting off um, as an ESL teacher, English as a Second Language, I knew that my students relied heavily on the material and that they needed to learn English for various reasons. I didn't know which reasons there were. But my assignments filled up quickly and my classes were always filled to capacity. But once I took the time to ask them why they were in my classes, why they wanted to learn English, uh, things got better. One student explained that um, she wanted to be able to speak English with her child's teacher at school and see how her son was doing. You know, those parent-teacher interviews. The boy can say anything he wants, right? Yeah, I'm doing great, but your marks aren't great. So she wanted to learn English to be able to communicate with um, her son's teachers. And another one of my students was in construction. His motive for learning English was to be able to um, better understand his boss's instructions, um, explain instructions to the other workers, and move up at his job. So once I connected with my students and I learned why they wanted to learn English and what were their motives, uh, things got a lot easier. They became better communicators and my classes were always full because I developed my reputation as being a caring and open teacher willing to satisfy their needs. Zig Ziglar talked about this in his seminars, books, and cassettes. If you remember the cassettes, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. And if you followed his career, he was a, a pot salesman, not that kind of pot. Uh, he was a cookware salesman. And he would sometimes consign his cookware to home cooks so that they could sell their food to make enough money to buy the cookware. So he practiced what he preached. When leaders focus more on themselves and not so much on their position, they're displaying immaturity. Since maturity is the ability to see and act on behalf of others. And ambitious leaders lead from their title and follow policy, tend to order people without showing them any respect or consideration, then there is no fair value to everyone. This point is highlighted in an excerpt from the book, The Empowered Communicator by Calvin Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller was a Baptist minister out of Omaha, PhD in theology, who had published 75 books um, on theology and inspiration. Dear speaker, your ego has become a wall between yourself and me. You're not really concerned about me. You're more concerned about yourself and whether your speech is working or whether you're doing a good job or not. You're really afraid that I will not applaud, aren't you? You're afraid that I won't laugh at your jokes or cry over your emotional anecdotes. You're so caught up in the issue of how I'm going to receive your speech you haven't uh, thought about much of me, much about me at all. I might have loved you, but you haven't thought of me, about me at all. I might have loved you, but you're so caught up in the act of self-love that mine is completely unnecessary. I don't give you my attention because I feel it's so unnecessary. When I see you at your microphone, I see narcissists in his mirror. Is your tie straight? Is your hair straight? Is your department impeccable? Is your phraseology perfect? You seem to be in control of everything but your audience. You see everything so well but us. But this blindness to us, I'm afraid, made us deaf to you. We must go now. Sorry. Call us sometime later. We'll come back to you. When you're real enough to see us after your dreams have been shattered, after your heart has been broken, and your arrogance has been reckoned with despair. There will be room for all of us in your world, and then you won't care if we applauded your brilliance. You'll be one of us. Then you will tear down your ego and use those very stones to build a bridge of a warm relationship 
We'll meet you on that bridge. We'll hear you then. All speakers are joyously understood when they reach with understanding your audience. So whatever it is that you do, you should be able to ask three connecting questions. And they are, do you care for me? Can you help me in some way? And can I trust you? In 1990, I was about 25, and I found a job as a uh, ceramic tile salesman, of all things, right? I thought I'd work in the showroom, showing off uh, uh, ceramic tiles for kitchens and uh, contractors, but they put me in the uh, bargain basement, remnants, where after the contractor finished the job, there would be remnants of tiles that had to be sold, and... Um, flashbacks, things like that, small kitchen jobs, small bathroom jobs. And there were two of us. Me, uh, Bob was our boss, and there was me and Stefan. I was about 25 years old at the time, and uh, just really grateful to have a job. He showed us around, told us where the tiles were. Um, we walked around the warehouse, told us how to write an order, um, how to you know, talk with customers, ask them what they need, and uh, showed us the inventory. And then when Stefan was on break, Bob says, Richard, come here. Said, what is it? He says, listen, I want you to know that you're being paid hourly and commission. But don't tell Stefan, because he's only being paid hourly. Like, Great. Felt special. I was able to lift 50 pounds. Bilingual? Was it my BA in creative writing? Was it my, my hair at the time? I don't know. I felt special. Um, and then one day, been working on the job for a couple of days, um, I saw Stefan talking to my customer, right? This guy had come in, he was a landscaper, he came in for the uh, large 18 by 18 terracotta tiles. At the time, it was like 850 a square foot, so it was a nice commission. I had helped him load these tiles in his truck. He was my guy, right? So I went over and I said, uh, this is my guy, this is my customer. Says, what do you care who serves the customer? You're being paid hourly. So we figured it out. Bob had told us the same thing. He wanted us to be on time for work. He wanted us to stay the full shift and be attentive to customers. He could have just told us that, right? He didn't have to play that game that we would compete against each other for customers because it was an end game that was figured out pretty soon. He didn't ask the three connecting questions. Session three, communication goes beyond words. When many people try to communicate with others, they believe the message is all that matters. The message is, of course, quite important. What you're saying is crucial, but the reality is that communication goes way beyond words. You might have heard the study done by UCLA uh, Psychology Professor Emeritus Albert Ibrahim, he discovered that face-to-face -face communication can be broken down to three components. Words, tone of voice, and body language. What he found in the study was others will believe what we say when we communicate. What others see accounts for 55%. The way we say it accounts for 38%, and what we say only counts for 7%.
So amazingly, more than 90% of the impression we often convey has nothing to do with what we actually say. So 70% is only what we say. The way we say it, 38%. What others say, 55%. And the three components of communication are thought, action, and emotion. Thought, of course, is something we already know. Emotion, something we feel. And action, something we do or something we want someone else to do. So these three components are crucial when it comes to communicating our beliefs or our ideas to somebody else. If I communicate something I know but do not feel, my communication is dispassionate. It's empty. And people can see through it. Something I know but do not do, my communication is theoretical. Right? Do unto others as you want others to do unto you. The same thing with communication. Don't let it be too theoretical or lofty. Something I feel but do not know my communication is unfounded. How can you tell me to do it if you don't do it yourself? Something I feel but do not do my communication is hypocritical. Now I think you should do this, but I'm not going to do it because uh, you know I don't feel like it. Or it hasn't helped me, but you should do it for yourself. If I communicate something I do but do not know, my communication is presumptuous. How can you tell someone to do something if you haven't tried it out yourself? Something I do but do not feel, then my communication is mechanical. So thought, action, and emotion must all work together and be congruent. Henry Ward Beecher asserted, there are persons so uh, radiant, so genial, so kind, so pleasure-bearing that you instinctively feel good in their presence. It's like they're a shining light that comes into the room. To communicate with people visually, expand your range of expression, move with a sense of purpose, and maintain an open posture. Any message that you try to convey with others must contain a piece of you. Knowledge should be experiential. Nothing can happen until this happens. And when it comes to thought, to communicate with people intellectually, knowledge must be experiential. Something we know, something we understand, something we feel that other people understand. And in terms of emotion, something we feel, connecting emotionally, trying to influence other people's emotions and how they feel. In terms of experience, there was a, a fox a bear and a wolf hunting deer up in Yosemite. Good time for deer hunting, by the way. They had their camouflage gear, they had their licenses all registered, and together the bear, the fox, and the wolf all caught three deer collectively. So they're having a little powwow, a little meeting, and the bear says, 
Wolf, how do you think we should divide this foil? Well, the wolf is a logical guy. Thinks intellectually. Reasonable. Says, well, bear, there are three deer. I think you should each get one. One deer for each of us. So the bear ate the wolf. Didn't like that idea. The fox is sitting there like, damn, it could be me. So now it's the fox's turn to answer, and the bear says to him, so fox, your turn. How do you think we should divide the spoils? So the fox thinks for a second and says, well, bear, I think you should get the wolf's share. You should get my share. And of course, you should keep yours. The bear is amazed. The bear says, Fox, where did you get this wisdom? He says, that's easy. From the wolf. Right? So we all learn from experiences that affect us. Uh, John Carter, author of a book titled A Sense of Urgency, states that for centuries we have heard the expression great leaders win over the hearts and minds of, of others. Note that he doesn't say minds and hearts. The heart always comes first. So if we desire to be good uh, communicators, we need to keep that in mind. If you want to win over another person, first win the heart and the mind will follow. People may hear your words, but they feel your attitude. People will not always remember what you said. They will not always remember what you did. But they will remember how you made them feel. Connecting can also influence and persuade people to a certain degree. On one flight, um, I was in coach, um, and I took the window seat, and it was like I was in some commercial, beautiful blonde sits right in the middle seat right next to me, and she's putting away her purse, and right about when we were getting ready to take off, she puts on her neck pillow, and she's getting ready to go to sleep. I want some company, though. I say, you know what, let's play a game to pass the time. He says, listen, I'm really tired. I, I just came off a long meeting. I just want to go to sleep. I don't want to play any games. I said, no, no, I'll make it worth your while. Let's say I ask you a question. And if I don't know the answer, if you don't know the answer, you give me $5. And then, you ask me a question, if I don't know the answer, I'll give you $5. He says, look, buddy, he's getting defensive now. He says, listen, I really don't want to play games. So I up the ante. I say, look, let's do, let's do this. I'll ask you a question. And if you don't know the answer, you have to give me $5. But if you ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I'll give you $500. So now she takes off the neck pillow and she's ready to play. I go, okay, great. So I have her. I say, tell me, what is the capital of Indiana? I don't know. Reaches to her first, gives me five bucks. Why, this is going great. So now it's my turn. He says, what goes up a mountain on four legs? Don't tell me yet. And comes down on three. What kind of animal broke a Broke leg. Like I broke. So I say, give me a minute. I'm like, to use the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi never works on a plane, but I'm trying anyway. Um, thinking of asking other passengers. And I don't know. Um, 
ready to open up a window. It's like 10 minutes have already passed, and she's getting ready to go to sleep. So I go, I have no idea. So I give her five $100. And then she puts back on the neck pillow, and she starts going to sleep. I say, wait a second. What's the answer? She gives me five bucks. So, connecting principle number four, communication requires energy. All of the great communicators, uh, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins, put a lot of energy into, the, into their communication careers and drew people to them. Think of any high school reunion, family reunion, any time where you see people change over the years despite their background. You go back and some people are married, some stayed single, some are divorced. Some are divorced and remarried, maybe once or twice. Um, some had kids, some didn't. Some are successful, some not. Some gained weight, some lost weight, gained it back. Anytime you go back to your roots, to your origins, there's going to be changes. After any long absence, you should search for memorabilia of a time together, a yearbook, an old uh, basketball uniform. Work on remembering everyone's names. Try to make people feel special. Make the visit personal for as many people as possible and make an effort to spend extra time with people. During your time together, share the mistakes that were made. Acknowledge the people you came up with as part of your success. The four unpardonable sins of a communicator. Being unprepared, uncommitted, uninteresting, and uncomfortable. Three of the four require a lot of effort and energy. Connecting requires initiative. Go first. Sam Walton in um, the headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas, had a 10-foot rule that if he were to come within 10 feet of any employee, whether he knew them or not, he would always try to look them in the eye and greet them. Malcolm Bain, if you wait until you can do everything for everybody, instead of something for somebody, you will end up doing nothing for anybody. There's a Jewish proverb, uh, the wise man does at once what the fool does last. Connecting requires clarity, patience, slow down, selflessness, give, and stamina. So you want to focus on all of these qualities if you're communicating with your audience, with listeners, um, with team members at work. When it comes to integrity, did I do my best? Your expectation? Did I please my sponsor or my customer? Relevance? Did I understand and relate to the audience? Value? Did I add value to the person's life? An application? Did I give people a game plan to take action in their lives? Change? Did I make a difference? Henry David Thoreau said, the man who goes alone can start the day, but he who travels with another must wait until the other is ready. So communication requires that you give of yourself. I got this letter um, when I retired from the adult school from one of my students. I thought about why you're so easy to listen to. The idea especially intrigued me. And I thought about the fact that it's true even when people know what you're going to say. And it definitely goes beyond the entertainment value of just good storytelling. I think it all comes down to a communicator 
who is primarily a giver instead of a taker. The human spirit senses and feeds on a giving spirit. The spirit is actually received by a teacher with a giving spirit. And that's proven by the fact that when people hear what you uh, have said many times, they're still filled. Your teaching is especially, essentially giving, and people can receive all day from a giver while they quickly tire from a taker. If communicators teach out of need, insecurity, ego, or even responsibility, they're not giving. The needy person wants praise, something he craves from the audience. The insecure person wants approval and acceptance from the audience. The egotistical person wants to be lifted up. And even the person motivated by responsibility wants to be recognized as the faithful worker to be seen as responsible something he wants from the audience. Many communicators teach in one of these taking modes and not aware of it. Then there's the giver. The person who wants to add value to the audience's life. This person teaches out of love, grace, and compassion. They're all giving modes. And each of these modes of the heart, the audience doesn't have anything to have to give anything, only receive. The teaching then becomes a gift. This is you. This is why people can listen to you all day. When you communicate, you teach 99% from a giving mode. Only very rarely do you slip into ego mode, where you're focusing more on your message, focusing more on yourself and your delivery. I no longer feel like you are giving, you are taking, and that comes out so as I'm special a little better than you. Connecting also requires stamina. Lauren Wolf said leadership takes an almost bottomless supply of verbal energy, working the phones, um, having conferences, staying focused on your work, on your message, and repeating the same mantra over and over again until your listeners understand the message. So that's why you should always take time to recharge yourself. Whatever it is that works for you. That's why you have those blanks. Love your life. Love what you do. Spend time with your family. Um, hand off draining work or household tasks to somebody else, if that will give you some free time. Friendships. Being alone. Exercise. Prayer. And at times, Meditation. Connecting is more than uh, natural talent. Connecting while you communicate with your audience, session five. Connecting is more skill than natural talent. Great communicators are not all cut from the same cloth, but they do all share the same ability to connect. Um, and this skill does not develop by accident or by dumb luck. There was a leader of a wagon train of pioneers back in the Old West that was going across the Western Plains. And when a lookout spotted a cloud of dust in the distance moving toward them, they knew they were in trouble. There was a band of Native American braves thundering toward them, and the leader ordered the wagon train to circle, the former circle behind a hill. So that when the leader saw that, um, the tall figure of a chief silhouetted against the sky, he decided to go down, meet the chief, and try to communicate somehow with the chief. So they uh, communicated, and then the leader of the wagon train went back up to talk to the pioneers. And they said, what happened? He said, well, 
as you saw, we couldn't speak each other's languages, so we had to use symbols and signs to communicate our message. So I drew a circle in the dust to show that we're all in this one land together. Right? And then he drew a line through it, as if to say, well, there are two groups of people in this one land. Right? Two nations that have to share the land. And then I pointed my finger up in the sky to say that we're two nations in one land under God. And then he reached into one of his pouches and he gave me an Indian. So naturally I understood that it indicated the multiple layers of understanding that we have to peel away so that we come to mutual agreements and we're able to live in this one land. To show him that I understood his meaning, I gave him an egg to show our goodwill. But he was too proud to accept it, so he just turned and walked away. Meanwhile, the warriors were getting ready to attack. So, the old warrior put up his hand and recounted his experience. And he says, when we came face to face, we both knew we didn't speak the same tongue. The man drew a circle in the dust, so I knew that we were surrounded. I drew a line through the circle to show them that we would cut them in half. Even if we were surrounded, we would cut them in half. Then he raised a finger to the sky as if to say that he could take all of us on by himself. Then I gave him an onion to tell him that it would, soon he would taste the bitter tears of defeat and death. But he ate the onion in defiance. Then he showed me an egg to tell me how fragile our position is. So I'm thinking, there must be others close by. Let's get out of here. So when it comes to communication, um, try to find some common ground so there won't be any misunderstandings, as there was between the pioneers and the uh, Native Americans in that uh, scene long ago. What's make, what makes people listen? If you want to be a better communicator or a better leader, you can't depend on dumb luck like the pioneers and the uh, Native Americans. You must learn to connect with others by making the most of whatever skills and experience you have. Whenever I listen to great communicators, I notice there are a handful of factors that seem to draw upon to cause people to listen to them. So, relationships, who you know, sacrifice, how you live, insight, what you know, success, what you have done in your life, and ability, what you can do. So successful communicating depends on um, all of these factors working together to some degree or another in order to produce successful communicating as the end result. You might be more skilled in one aspect than another. Um, So after intermission, we'll continue with chapter 6. All right, so connecting practices, common ground is when um, everyone is sharing the same experience. Terry Felbert, in the author of Am I Making Myself Clear, said people have different uh, representational systems. For example, you have this when people are walking down um, a sandy beach. 
one might remember the feeling of the sand against his feet. Another might remember um, the smell of uh, suntan lotion from nearby sunbathers. Another might remember the, uh, the mist from the ocean. And we all take back different parts of an experience with us. And Felber says, if you can learn to pinpoint how those people around you experience the world and really try to experience the world the way they do, you'll be amazed how your communication can be improved and be more effective. Um, reminds me of this time in uh, Manhattan, there was a new church being built. And a news reporter went up to the workers, the bricklayers, and asked them, why are you doing this? So we asked the first bricklayer, why are you doing this? He says, ah, it's a union job, you know. Um, if they told me to do drywall, I would have done drywall. If they told me to paint, I would have painted. I just go where they send me. Thank you. And then the news reporter asked the second bricklayer, says, why are you doing this job? He says, well, it's 18 bucks an hour. These days, it's hard to find any labor job that pays 18 bucks an hour, so I grabbed it right away. And then they asked the third bricklayer, why are you doing this job? He said, why? I'm building a cathedral. Come back when we cut the ribbon. So it all depends on your perspective. You could be in a team. You could be in a group. You could be even be in a family. And uh, there won't be common ground, or you have to work towards finding a shared experience. And uh, the secret to success in, in communication, all your endeavors, depends on your attitude, having enthusiasm, and pride in whatever you do. You choose your attitude every day, and sometimes you have to change it a few times a day. Big picture thinking, being able to see the end result, rather than just the task at hand. Barriers to finding common ground are assumption, arrogance, control, and indifference. Assumption means, I already know what others want, so it's okay. Leave me out of it. Arrogance, I don't need to know what others know feel, or want. Indifference, I don't really care to know what others know, feel, or want. And control, I don't want others to know what I know, feel, or think. I'm in control. I've got this. This is my project. So we should try to avoid any barriers to finding common ground. Supreme Court Justice Louis D. Brandeis observed, nine-tenths of the serious controversies that arise in our society are a result of misunderstandings and miscommunication. From one man not knowing the facts from which uh, the other man seem important or otherwise failing to appreciate his point of view. And indifference, I don't care what others know, feel, or want. Uh, you have this quip, uh, comedian George Carlin said that they announced today they have a cure for apathy. However, no one really has the slightest interest in it. Because they don't care about a cure for apathy. In lead, follow, or get out of the way, Jim Lundy in includes responses of people who work in an environment where leaders hold back from them. He writes about the subordinate's lament, and maybe you've heard this one before, which says, we the uninformed working for the uh, inaccessible are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. And the mushroom farm lament, viewer discretion is advised, 
we feel we're being kept in the dark every once in a while. Some comes around and spreads manure on us. When our heads pop up, they're chopped off, and then we are tanned. So choices that would help you find common ground are availability. I choose to spend time with others and make myself available to others. Listening, I will listen my way to common ground. The next one is questions. I will actively ask questions and be interested in others. As Dale Carnegie Carnegie said, you have to be interesting and interested to communicate with others. And thoughtfulness, I will think of others and look for ways to help them. Openness, I will let people into my life, not only when I need them, but when they need me. Likeability, I will care about people. And humility, capacity for self-criticism and allowing others to shine, and adaptability. I will move from my world to others. On these notes, Sonia Hamlin in her book says that we have to eliminate a me first type of attitude. When you're talking with somebody, it requires giving up your favorite human pastime, self-involvement. Thinking about your own self-interest, thinking about what you have to do, did I leave the coffee maker on? What do I have to do after work today? Actively listening to the other person. And it's where motivation to say anything comes from. But this is a base. Can you see what a problem is created when we're asked to listen to somebody else? And Roger Ailes, a former communication consultant, the president believes that the most important factor in public speaking is likability. Um, people won't listen to you if they don't like you. On the subject of humility, poet, journalist, and uh, editor Alan Ross said that humility means knowing and using your strength for the benefit of others on behalf of a higher purpose. Try to think of all of the presidents who were humble leaders. The humble leader is not weak, but strong, not preoccupied with self, but how to use his or her strength for the good of the people. And the humble leader does not think less of himself, but chooses to consider the needs of others in fulfilling a worthy cause. I love to be in the presence of a humble leader because they bring out the very best in me. Their focus is on my purpose, <clears throat> my contribution, and my ability to sell out all I accomplish. So when it comes to common ground, do I feel what you feel before asking, do you feel what I feel? Do I see what you see before asking, do you see what I see? Do I know what you know before asking, do you know what I know? And do I know what you want before asking, do you know what I want? Having a good exchange of ideas will help. Session 7 talks about simplicity. Connectors do the work of keeping things really simple for us. Around 2007, 2008, I was working at, um, didn't really mention the company, um, I was working in financial services at a bad time, right before the housing bubble, 2007, 2009, I was trying to sell life insurance and investments. 
click, click, click. There was one hedge fund man manager that I knew in 2009, right before the Great Recession, he decided enough of all of this. He was disillusioned. He didn't want to continue in the world of financial services anymore. So he became a monk. He found a place out near New Mexico where they accept all members. And he decided to give up the world of financial gain and material things and devote his life to God and serving. So the friar turns to him and says, welcome to the monastery. We have a few rules, but this one is really important. Every seven years, you're allowed to say two words. Just two words. He says, okay. Shown to his room, gets his things, gets his uh, rock. The first seven years go by. And the friar says, okay, what do you have to say? So he says, floor is cold. And then goes back to his room. Another seven years go by. And the friar says, okay, what are your two words this time? He says, food, bad. He goes back to his room. Another seven years pass. And the friar says, okay, what are your two words this time? He says, I quit. And the friar says, good, you did nothing but complain the whole time you were here. So we want to keep things simple for our listeners in a way that shows that we care about them and we want them to understand. Four components are required to connect through communication, and they are humor, heart, hope, and help. and the three S's of communication. Simple, slowly, smile, sort of like that, yeah. So when it comes to humor, have something that will uh, make people laugh. When it comes to heart, something that will captivate their emotion. When it comes to hope, something that will inspire people, and when it comes to help, something that people could use in a tangible way. These days we call that the, the takeaway. What can we take from this? What can we take from this conversation? Right? And in our age of communication, sometimes communication is too simple where you could break up with somebody in a text. I want to see other people. <laughs> Sorry. When it comes to communicating in groups, keep it simple, say it slowly, and have a smile. Talk to people, not above them. Get to the point as soon as you can. When the person asking for the recommendation isn't someone they want to endorse, their responses can be very creative. You have these interpretations in your handout. In the book, The Lexicon of Inten Intentionally Ambiguous Recommendations by Robert Thornton. She was always high, in my opinion. She was often seen smoking a joint. While he worked with us, he was given numerous citations. He was arrested many times. I would say that his real talent is getting wasted at his current job. He gets bombed regularly. And you won't believe this woman's credentials. We're always wondering, too. You'll never catch him asleep on the job. He's too crafty to get caught. He doesn't know the meaning of the word quit. He doesn't know how to spell it, either. Also, repetition is important. Say something over and over again until it sticks. The first time you say something, it's heard. 
the second time you say something, it's recognized. The third time, it's usually learned. Say it clearly, have an understanding so there won't be a misunderstanding. Jack Welsh, the former CEO of General Electric, put this quite succinctly. He said, insecure managers create complexity. Frightened and nervous managers use thick, convoluted planning and busy slides filled with everything they've known since childhood. So say less. So, the art of simplicity, talk to people not above them, get to the point, say it over and over again, say it clearly, and say less. Section 8, connectors create an experience everyone enjoys and remembers. How to be interesting. Take responsibility for your listeners. In general, there are no bad audience, only bad speakers. Communicate where the audience is in their world. People don't remember what we think is important. They remember what they think is important. Capture uh, people's attention from the start. People have remote controls in their heads today, if you don't catch their interest, they just click you off. Myrna Morosky. Also, say something so it sticks. Patrick Henry's famous line, give me liberty or give me death. Nathan Hale, I regret that I have one life to give for my country. Abraham Lincoln said, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up. John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And Martin Luther King's famous line, I have a dream. Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Of course, we have to see if they're all 140 characters and see if they're tweetable these days. But they are great messages that we all remember and have incorporated into our lives. This was one letter sent to um, Mr. Maxwell. He said, Dear Speaker, the world has never gotten over its liking of the truth. I've been a number, to a number of churches now for more than 50 years. We must have had plenty of pastors during that time. I don't know for sure. None of them stayed very long. Every one of them told the truth. In fact, they could bore you for hours and hours on end with the truth. There was only one of the whole bunch that one wanted to keep. He told the truth interestingly. One time he put on his bathrobe and he played like he was King David. Sure was interesting. Another time he played like he was an innkeeper in Bethlehem. That held our attention. Then one time he smeared his face with soot. He looked strange. And he told us that he was Job. We all knew better. And we knew that he wasn't Job. But then I really never understood that book of Job until that sermon. One time he dressed up in a white robe and came back in the auditorium carrying a sign. He said he was the archangel. He seemed so convinced that we believed him. Darnest thing he'd do near anything to keep our attention. The good ones always seem to get away. They arrested a man over by Greenville the other day. They threw him in jail. He was walking around town in a white robe carrying a sign that said, The world is coming to an end. I don't know why they arrested him. Most everybody believed he was right. As I saw it, he was telling the truth interestingly. Last week, my preacher preached on the very same thing. The way he told that same truth, that was interesting. They might have locked up the wrong man. 
It sure seems appropriate to tell the truth interestingly. Not too many people do it. A bunch of us who listen to your sermons are wishing you'd do it. You might try the white robe and sign. Just don't go outside your audience. So try to make your communication real for your audience. Try to make it so that it's effective and create an experience that everybody could enjoy. Take responsibility for your listeners. Communicate in their world. Capture people's attention from the start. Say it so it sticks. The next section, communicators inspire people. How much does it really matter if someone is highly motivated at their job or at their work? Studies have shown that in my research, how much motivation really matters is astounding to me. I had to cross-check my references to find out. Many studies I've read tossed around numbers like 40% or even higher um, when they compare the performance of motivated employees with versus unmotivated employees. One study said that motivated employees are 80% less likely to leave an organization compared to unmotivated employees. Many studies said that people are uh, motivated at work, call in with dramatically fewer sick days and report fewer insurance claims, less employee theft, and fewer wasted hours. So there's a huge difference in the outcome, the deliverables, the achievements of motivated people versus unmotivated people, but you all know this from personal experience. There's no doubt about it, everyone benefits from motivation. Everyone wants to be inspired. So there is an inspiration equation. What people know plus what people see plus what people feel leads to inspiration. What we know, what we see, what we feel leads to inspiration that we can act on. So what people know that you understand them and that you are focused on them. That you have expectations of them, how they will behave and how they will react towards you. What do people need to see? People need to see your conviction, your example. President Lyndon B. Johnson asserted that what convinces people is your conviction. Believe in the argument you're advancing. If you don't, you're as good as dead. The other person will sense that something is in there and there, there's no chain of reasoning no matter how logical or elegant or brilliant will win your case for you. People need to see your example. The mediocre teacher tells. The good teacher explains, the great teacher will demonstrate. And when it comes to what people need to feel, of course they need to feel your confidence in yourself and your gratitude for them. So, in your handouts, there is a list of accomplishments. Of course, we all have our own lists. And in your notes, you should be proud of all of your accomplishments. I raised two sons, not alone, with my wife. They're 12 and 19. Uh, I've been married to the same woman for 19 years. I worked in the same field of teaching for 27 years. And I've run 41 full marathons, 65 half marathons, and over 100 5K, 10K, and 15 runs. Uh, I have bad knees. <laughs> so uh, believe in yourself, believe in your accomplishments, 
write down your own Rocky story. Be proud of your accomplishments and build on them every day. One day, the people who didn't believe you will tell everyone how they met you. Section 10 talks about credibility, the currency that connectors have. There's a credibility checklist. Currency for leaders and communicators with it, they're solvent. Without it, they are bankrupt. The first six months, communication overrides credibility. And after six months, credibility overrides communication. The checklist is, have I communicated with myself? Relationships we have with others are largely determined by relationships we have with ourselves. So lead by example. Have I made my uh, right my wrongs? Am I accountable? When you make a commitment, you create hope. When you make a commitment, you create trust. Being accountable for your actions. Also, do I lead like I live? Have I connected with myself? Have I made right my wrongs? Am I accountable? And do I lead like I live? Author and speaker Jim Rohn observed, you cannot speak that which you do not know, you cannot share that which you do not feel, and you cannot translate that which you do not have, and you cannot give that which you do not possess. To give it and share it, and to do it to be effective, first, you need to have that with you. Do I tell the truth? Am I making myself vulnerable? Parker Palmer, author of The Courage to Teach, says we all know that perfection is basically a mask. So we don't trust the people behind the know-it-all masks. They're not being honest with us. The people with whom we have the deepest connection are those who acknowledge their weaknesses. Am I following the golden rule? Whatever your established way of doing things is, the protocol, if you will. And do I deliver results to my audience, to my team? Peter Drucker, father of modern management, asserted communication always makes demand. It always demands that the recipient become somebody, do something, believe something. And it appeals to our motivation. In other words, communicators exhort people to deliver results. And to be credible, you must also deliver results yourself. For example, in the Old Testament, Moses was really not good with people. He was not a very effective communicator. Some might argue that he was not a great leader because of that. However, When God said to Moses, hey, let your brother communicate for you. And he'll help you. But it was Moses who convinced Pharaoh to let the Jews out of Egypt. And because of that, they were all set free. These traits were communicated unmistakably to those who were exposed to him, both follower and foe. So he took whatever ability he had and he made the most of it. He did what he was called to do 
he did what he was empowered to do to free his people. And an entire nation grieved for him for 30 days. So, like the lion in the jungle, when you communicate, don't communicate out of position. Don't communicate out of leadership. But try to connect with your audience, connect with your listeners, and communicate in a way that they'll understand your communication, they'll believe in it, and they'll take action. Thank you.